This morning we continue with the study that we began last week on the names of God. We're going to look at one particular name. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis and stand with me. The very first chapter of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read the first three verses to you. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And Lord, as we uh, pause for a moment, we ask once again for your word to pierce us through. Teach us, Lord, what these names mean because we want to know you through your names. And so we pray that you'll uh, be here today and let your spirit speak to us and teach us those wonderful truths that you hid in your word so long ago. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And as we study the names of God, that is our mission. Our purpose, of course, is to know God, to know Him better than we did before we got in our cars and headed here today. We want to know Him more. Uh, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. That's eternal life. God wants to be known. He wants us to know him. But much of his nature, much of his, his character uh, remained quite a mystery until Jesus revealed the true God to us when he came to this earth. Hebrews tells us this, Hebrews chapter 1. It says, long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And in verse 2 of chapter 1 of Hebrews, and now in these final days, God has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, he created the universe. So Jesus is the perfect revelation of God to us in every way. But before Jesus came, <clears throat> men only knew God really through what he let us see or what he let man see through his names these explanations of himself which were god's revelation to man about himself and they were given to us through the prophets the names of course are very beautiful and uh they provide for us with information information uh, that is really embodied in Jesus Christ. Jesus seems to give us the full and complete revelation of the true and living God. As uh, uh, John said in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is God himself, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. And so with that, we want to look at this very first name of God, the very first name that has ever been revealed to us and, and recorded in Scripture, the name Elohim. Now, uh, we want to look at the definition of the name Elohim, uh, but mostly I want you to see what it means for us today. Now, if you're looking at the text, you're saying, Elohim, I don't see the name Elohim anywhere. I see in the beginning God. Well, God in Hebrew is Elohim. And so that's why we look at this in this way today. Elohim is a very prominent name in the Old Testament and is used often in the early chapters of Genesis in particular. It's used over 3,000 times in the Bible, and in the first two chapters, the name Elohim is used 46 times, uh, and in particular in relationship to God's creation. So in Genesis 1-1, we read, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And there are many things that we want to know about Elohim, many things we should know. And the first is, Elohim is eternal. Elohim is eternal. In the first verse, once again, we read, in the beginning, God. In the beginning. Now, the English adds a lot of extra words. It needs to in order for it to make sense in our language. But the Hebrew language simply says, beginning, God. <laughs> beginning, God. It makes it pretty simple. And what that means, of course, is that God always was. God was there at the beginning. And we really, it's difficult for us to grasp that concept. It's hard for us to understand anything without a beginning or an end. 
And that's because our minds are finite, meaning limited. Our uh, God is infinite, unlimited, and most everything about him is far beyond what we can comprehend with the human mind. Job said he does great things past finding out, wonders without number. In Job chapter 9 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul said something similar in Romans chapter 11. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is to understand. And that's our God. Difficult to understand. And like it or not, there are a lot of things about God that we're just not going to understand and never will, at least from this side of heaven. It's going to be impossible. But our God is eternal. And the scriptures confirmed this. Moses, writing in Psalm 90, said, before the mountains were born, or before you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Moses also said in Deuteronomy 33, the eternal God, that word God is Elohim, is your refuge and his everlasting arms are under you. And so Elohim is eternal from beginning to end. And from beginning to end, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. The second thing we can know about Elohim is that Elohim is existent. Now once again, the first verse uh, reads, in the beginning, God. Simply uh, meaning, of course, beginning God in the Hebrew language. Do you realize that the Bible never gives any evidence for the existence of God. doesn't even provide it. It just assumes it. It just assumes, in the beginning, God. And it expects that we're intelligent enough to realize that God exists. In fact, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So any intelligent person knows that there is a God. Still, In the opening verse of the Bible, it's a tough pill for many people to swallow because a lot of people simply don't believe in God. Or they believe in a superstitious God, or perhaps they may even believe in some form of a religious God. But it doesn't translate into other parts of life, other parts of intelligent thought like science and other things. God is just, well, well, he's just part of a religion. You can't have a religion without God. And so we have to have a God. But they don't really believe in God. But biblically, the existence of God is simply and humbly assumed and accepted as a matter of fact. And we're expected to accept it. And we're expected to accept it, if need be, by faith. The book of Hebrews says this in chapter 11 and verse 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. We must believe that God exists, and and a certainty in God's existence is fundamental to our faith. We believe that he exists. And once we've settled that issue, then there isn't anything that God cannot do. Once we settle the fact that God exists, Now, on a side note, once we grasp these these two points that I've just mentioned, that Elohim uh, is eternal and that Elohim is existent, then we will also know that that means he is ever-present. He is everywhere. And we know that he's not only the God of the past and the God of the future, but he's also the God of the present who is with us at all times. Revelation 11, 17, it says that that, uh, he's the one who is who was and who is to come. In Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible declaring very simply that God is eternal and he is existent. That is Elohim. But can we prove the existence of God? I can say without a doubt, no, we cannot. (laughs) We cannot prove the existence of God any more than an atheist can prove that God does not exist. We cannot prove it. But there is a difference between proof and evidence, meaning many of us believe God exists because we've seen evidence 
of his presence. And for us, that's proof enough. However, uh, the issue is, is not about proving God's existence, but it's really more about making an intelligent decision after viewing or weighing all of the evidence or as much evidence as we can muster up. Anyone wishing to know the truth about God, anyone wanting to believe that he exists, who is honestly seeking the truth, owes it to himself to take that intelligent look at the evidence. And that brings me to the third point that I want to make about Elohim. Elohim is the creator. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. And the Hebrew word for created is bara, B-A-R-A, bara. Hebrew scholars claim that this word bara means not formed from anything pre-existing, no pre-existing materials, but he made out of nothing. He created out of nothing. Now that's incredible on, on many levels. Incredible to realize that God has the power to create out of nothing, and it's incredible to believe. You're kidding me, right? How can we believe that? How can we be sure that God actually created in that way? Why can't we believe well, for instance, as the naturalist believes, or the evolution, uh, evolutionist who believes that evolution formed the earth, created everything that we know. Well, of course, for us, there is this obvious passage which tells us, quite simply, God created. And so, for many, that's as far as we ever go. We say that settles it. But why must we believe it? We're uh, far more scientific today. Uh, uh, we don't need to take the Bible so literally. Uh, the Bible is, is not scientific at all. In fact, the naturalist, the Darwinist, uh, may argue that religious thinking only holds us back from scientific discovery. So why do we insist on throwing that into the mix? But there's evidence. The evidence. What about the evidence? Well, believers prefer to understand creation as an intelligent act of an intelligent divine designer rather than some random act of chance or natural selection or the evolutionary process. In fact, we hold that God designed everything. And uh, not only because the Bible says so, but also because from our perspective, the evidence supports it. The evidence around us, the evidence within nature itself supports the fact that an intelligent design was involved. Now, the naturalist explains it away. The naturalist has a good explanation. He, he explains the existence of everything on earth through a very simple formula, and that is no one times nothing equals everything. And they say, we're holding science back. That's crazy. That's crazy thinking. Did you catch that? No one, meaning there was no designer, there's no intelligent design, brought nothing, they took nothing and created everything. That's the evolutionist simple, simple understanding. Of course, it's ridiculous. Not to mention, it's unsupported blind faith what they accuse us of doing. Unsupported, blind faith. And we hold that everything we see, including the human race, supports our confidence that an intelligent designer was necessary to bring about everything that we know in all of creation. It's impossible otherwise. And I'm happy to say that there are more and more naturalist scientists who are coming around to that same conclusion Though they may fall short of admitting that God designed it, they're still holding out that hopefully some aliens seeded the planet. Cuckoo! <laughs> still there are an increasing... No, and, and if you're here today and you are a naturalist or a Darwinist, I am so sorry for you. I hope this will wake you up. <laughs> I'm not sorry that I've said this. I'm sorry for you, and I hope you will wake up, because what faith you have is beyond anything that a Christian has. So, uh, cuckoo! Still, there is an increasing number of naturalists that are coming around, and they are admitting that the evidence of an intelligent creator is simply too overwhelming to deny any further. 
Well, what evidence are you talking about? Well, uh, I'd like to borrow from a book that I recently uh, have been reading, How, How Can I Know? It's uh, by a fellow named Robert Jeffress. The first thing I'd like to talk about is evidence of the universe. Now, Jeffress says that the slightest variation in any number of constants would have made the initial expansion of the universe that they call the Big Bang Theory impossible. As you know, the Big Bang Theory, theory is that which claims that by chance all of the conditions of the universe were just right in order for the universe to come into existence. Just by chance. Coincidence? Is it chance or is it design? Then there's the evidence of the earth itself. Scientists estimate that there are more than 100 conditions on our planet that form what they call an astronomical biological welcome mat for human beings, making the earth perfectly and uniquely suited for human life. Incredible, right? How incredible is that? It's like stumbling across an abandoned cabin in the mountains when you needed it most. As you approach that cabin, you discover that your favorite meal is cooking in the oven. At the same time, a cozy fire crackling in the fireplace, your little dog laying next to it. And not to mention, the TV is tuned to your favorite show. And incredibly, a secret underground bunker is stocked with recently made extinct hostess Twinkies. <laughs> Coincidence? Is it by chance or is it by design? And what about the evidence of water? Well, as you know, our, bo- our bodies are made up of consi- uh, cons- two-thirds of water. We, we require water. It's essential to our existence. In fact, Water is essential for all life on earth, and coincidentally, accidentally, by chance, I'm being sarcastic, the earth just happens to have an abundance of water. In fact, 97% of our planet's water supply actually lives in the salty oceans. That's where it resides. Now, there's a process known as evaporation. This process of evaporation is able to move salt water from the ocean, leaving the salt behind and dispersing fresh water over the entire earth, sustaining everything that lives throughout the planet. Incredible! Coincidence? By chance? Or by design? Now I can go on and on, of course, (coughs) with much more evidence such as we could talk about the planet's gravitational pull, which is set at just the right tension. A little too strong, we would be smashed to bits. A little too weak, we would be flying into outer space. It has to be just right. There's also a perfect balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. I don't know if you know this, but oxygen is necessary for us to breathe. A little bit too much carbon dioxide, and we're going to choke to death. A little bit too much oxygen, we may uh, blow up into balloons or something, become like the little blueberry girl in uh, uh, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory or whatever. And what about the complexity of the human cell? Further evidence of divine design, and we're still discovering things that we thought we already knew. What about the human body? If one can blame the human body on chance or natural selection, then that person must be a primate. Seriously. The human body is so completely miraculous and complex that you're either a primate or that one lives in perpetual and illogical ignorance and stubborn denial. It's like the psychiatrist who was trying to convince his patient that he wasn't dead. And the psychiatrist tried everything he could to tell his patient, you're not dead. But the, the patient was convinced that he was dead. Then the psychiatrist, frustrated, finally asked, do dead men bleed? And the patient responded, well, that's silly. Of course not. Dead men don't bleed. Of course, at that point, the psychologist, psychiatrist pulled out a pocket knife and cut the tip of his patient's finger. 
And the patient responded, well, what do you know? I guess dead men do bleed after all. (laughs) Elohim is the creator, period. I put an exclamation point in my notes. Fourthly, Elohim is a plurality. In the Hebrew language, Elohim is a plural word. It contains the ending of I am, I am, two letters, I am, and at the end of of a word in the Hebrew, it's like placing an S at the end of an English word, which makes it a plural. And so in Hebrew, I am is a plural ending. There is one cherub, there are two cherubim, there is one seraph, there are two seraphim, and so the root of Elohim is Ela or Eloa, which is really an Arabian version of Allah. You've heard that before. Of course, the Islam, the God of Islam or the Allah of Islam is an entirely different God than the God of the Bible or the biblical Elohim. Eloa literally means the adorable or the worshipful one. And Elohim, of course, is who we worship and is worthy of our worship. Elohim is a plural form of Eloah, which tends to get confusing for us. Plural to us, of course, typically means more than one. So if we apply a typical language rule, we would say God is singular, God's is plural. We don't worship a plurality of gods. We worship one God who is a plurality. Difficult. Fortunately, we don't need to understand it. We just need to worship him. We just need to accept this on the basis or through faith, but on the basis, once again, of the evidence. It's not blind faith. We have a reason for believing this. There's evidence. What evidence? Well, the evidence of Scripture and the evidence of the images of divinity or deity within the Bible narrative itself. The name Elohim, in fact, is the basis for the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we believe this because the Bible mentions all three of them And the name Elohim supports it. Do you understand? Now, we realize that the word Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible, but the evidence for it is. And it's really, as I said, difficult to explain and even more difficult to understand. Yet it is impossible to ignore it within the Scriptures. And so we conclude that there is a plurality which exists because of the evidence of these three members of the Godhead which are represented over and over and over again throughout the entire context of the Bible. Now, in many schools of interpretation, there's a law, a rule, that is known as the rule of first mention. In this rule, we uh, pay special attention to Uh, the first time a word is mentioned, the first time a name is mentioned, the first time a person is mentioned, and we pay special attention in those first cases. Well, in this case, we have the name Elohim. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, Elohim, first mention. What are the circumstances surrounding its usage? The first time this name is used, well, immediately we know it's creation. Creation. And immediately we can establish that Elohim is the creator and that the entire first mention of that name involves this account of creation. Notice also in verse 2 that one of the other members of the Trinity is mentioned. The spirit of Elohim. The word God there is Elohim. The spirit of Elohim was brooding over the waters. And then in verse 3, Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, Elohim then goes on to create everything. He he separates the waters on earth from the waters above the earth. He divides the dry land 
on the earth, from the waters on the earth. The day and from the night he separates. He calls all of his creation into existence by his very words, the power of his word. Fish and fowl come forth. Beef and bees are created. Grass and trees and everything that is green are suddenly appearing all over the world. And he saw everything and that he created and said that it's all good. But then in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, and you should read this, in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26 and 27, we find the most amazing passage. (coughs) Excuse me. In verse 26, then Elohim said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In verse 27, so Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim created he him. Male and female created he them. Do you see what happened here in this text? Do you see the plural word Elohim intentionally used several times? Elohim. And clearly, the plural nouns are added to it. Us and, uh, pronouns, I mean, us and our are used along with it. Interesting. But in verse 27, we see that the plural word Elohim is used, but then refers to Elohim with the singular pronouns his and he. Wow. This is, this is not a mistake. This is all intentional, and you see where the, this rule of first mention becomes very, very important in this particular chapter and in this instance. But this is not uh, the only time that this happens in the Bible either. This is truly what we would call a mystery, a mystery of godliness. And in, according to the Bible, the Bible mysteries are truths that are, that were once hidden in the Old Testament, but revealed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. In other words, they were mysterious to the Old Testament saints, but New Testament saints see it. We get it. The mystery, the covering has been removed, and so now, now we see it. So later on in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22, we read, the Lord God, or in the Hebrew, Yahweh Elohim, said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Once again, you see Elohim in the plural, and of course the pronoun us, plural. At Babel, in Genesis chapter 11, in verse 7, at Babel we see Elohim said, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language. All right, well, we'll leave Genesis for a moment. In Isaiah chapter 6, in that classic passage, when Isaiah saw the Lord, do you remember? And Elohim asked, whom shall I, singular, send, and who will go for us, plural? This is fascinating stuff. Fascinating. God is revealing something about himself something of his nature, something that he hinted at throughout the Old Testament. And now the Jews, they don't believe this concept. They, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they only believe in the one God, as do we. However, we believe our one God is represented in three personalities, three persons. But the Jews don't buy into it, yet one of their favorite verses hints at the concept itself. Their favorite verse is called the Shema. The Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. And the verse reads in English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh, Elohim, Echad, Yahweh. You're impressed, right? I worked on that for hours. Now you'll recognize the name Elohim which is in the plural form, but the word in the English for one is echad in Hebrew, and it means collectively or altogether one. Altogether one. It's used in Genesis 2, 24 regarding marriage when God said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become echad, one flesh. They shall be made one. In other words, the two shall become one in plurality. 
They're one, but they're really two. And that's the same notion with our Godhead. And God is dropping clues. He's hinting, telling us something without actually saying it, that our God is three in one. You say, whoa, whoa, hold on here. Where does it say three in one? Where did you come up with three? How do we know there's three? Well, I must admit that the number three is an assumption. But it is an intelligent assumption, meaning it comes from the full context and the influence of the rest of Scripture. Yet, it's much more than an assumption. As I mentioned, there are only three personalities or three Bible personalities who are regularly ascribed with a divine nature, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And that's why we believe that the Hebrew Shema is speaking of three in one, or the Trinity, which is implied in the name Elohim. The Bible tells us that there are three creators, that there are three personalities, and all three of them were involved in creation. Though the Bible says in our English, in the beginning, God created. But we know that the whole of the Bible says, wait a minute, the Father created, the Son created, and the Spirit created. And all of them are given uh, credit for the creation. We know that the Father was there here in Genesis. We know that. But in Exodus, in chapter 20, verse 11, we read, For in six days the Lord, that's God, made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. That's God the Father. The Father was involved in, in the creation, but so was the Son. In John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. You can't get any clearer than that. That's ascribed to Jesus Himself. Either Jesus was not there, or He was there. He was there. We know He was there. The text is very clear. Paul the Apostle, confirming this in Colossians 1, said, For by him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Crystal clear. And of course, the Spirit was there too. We know that he was mentioned there in the second verse of the Bible. But even Job mentions the presence of the Spirit and the Spirit's involvement, saying, by His Spirit, God adorned or formed the heavens through the Spirit. So all three were there. They're all three eternal. All three involved in the creation. They're all three God and members of this one God or Godhead. All three of them are involved in our salvation. All of them. That's why it's important for us to know them today as our God. The Father, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Your salvation, God's gift to you. Jesus the Son, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved. Jesus saves us. And the Spirit involved in our salvation. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing or being born again by the Holy Spirit. This is Elohim. This is our God. He is eternal. He is existent. He is creator. And He is plurality. Do you know Him? And if you do know Him, then you know that He is worthy of our worship and worthy of your life in holy devotion on a daily basis. God, Elohim, your God, our God, he is there for your salvation, and he is our hope. Give your life to him. and Live your life for him, as all of them were involved in your life, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to bring you to this day. Shall we pray together? Lord, so much in this theology and knowing what your names mean, what they imply, and the things that we are to know about you, we certainly want to know more. Because the more we know and understand you, of course, the, the better it will be and easier it will be for us to worship you, for to know you is to love you. And so we continue to give you our lives. 
Lord, I pray for the one who has been challenged here today, perhaps someone who has only seen the evolutionary process, never thought about God. The schools, of course, are filled with atheistic thought. And so many of us have come through the ranks of atheistic professors and teachers. And the only thing they see is, is, is natural means rather than divine means. Perhaps someone today heard your voice. Despite all of the influence, all of the training, all of the atheistic uh, input, they've come to this moment when your love broke through into their hearts. If that describes you today, if you're listening on the radio, if you're listening online, if you're sitting here in this audience, has God's love broken through into your heart? Are you ready to see him for who he is, the great and wonderful creator, the one who is there with you in all things? He is there. He is eternal. He is existent. He is ever-present, and he's with you right here, right now. And he's convicting your heart, and he's telling you that he has a better life for you. But you have to turn away from your old thinking and turn away from your old life of sin and come to him in faith. And then he will show you. He will show you just how wonderful he is. And you can worship him too. Will you believe? Will you believe right here, right now? No further explanation. Right here, right now, believe. Turn your heart to Jesus Christ. Confess your sin. Do so in a prayer. Tell him, Jesus, I want to believe now. Forgive me of my sin. I believe in you. Write my name in your book of life and, and save that spot for me in eternity. I want to live with you. I want, to, I want to live for you on this earth. Fill me with your spirit so I might do so. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.